Are you experienced? When it comes to science, Joe Rogan is not. The climate change one is a weird one, so... Which makes his podcast problematic. One year after the military coup in Myanmar, democracy has died, journalists are paying the price. And the hashtags coming out of Ethiopia on Tigray that tell a story of a news and information vacuum. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert and you're at The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. A new front has opened in the battle over content moderation, turning our attention from Facebook and Twitter to the land of podcasts. Ever heard of the Joe Rogan Experience? It's an American podcast available on Spotify that gets bigger audiences than primetime television news programs do. Rogan's format is purposefully unjournalistic, freewheeling conversations with his guests. Sometimes he delves into topics like COVID-19, vaccines, and climate change, interviews that produce the kind of misinformation that can be dangerous. And that's provoked musicians like Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, and India Ari to pull their songs from Spotify. It's also attracted the attention of a White House that wants the platform to do more to combat misinformation. Rogan promises he'll do better, and Spotify is now adding content warnings on podcasts that deal with COVID-19, which has scientists wondering why the platform doesn't do more to correct that content before millions of Americans listen to it. Our starting point this week is the Joe Rogan Experience. For those who have yet to get a taste of the podcast they call the Joe Rogan Experience, here's what to expect. He keeps it casual. So is that a joint? There was that time Rogan shared a joint oh, a with Elon Musk. I mean, it's legal, right? It's totally legal. Okay. Uh, tobacco and marijuana in there. That's all it is. Prepare for a stream of consciousness conversation, spiced with profanity, that we beep out because Rogan doesn't. But that makes sense. Like, mother God some political, social content sprinkled in. I vote left on almost everything, except gun control. And with society going through the COVID-19 experience, a little science. From time to time, some fake news. Well, I am very pro-vaccine. This is not a vaccine. This is essentially a gene therapy. Joe Rogan isn't trying to replicate what's already out there in sort of mainstream media or traditional news media outlets. Programs that include fact checkers, producers, editors, anchors. Joe Rogan really views his programming as an ordinary person just having conversations with all kinds of people. It's the kind of conversations you may end up hearing at your local diner, at the water cooler, or maybe even in your living room or, or dining table with your family. Joe Rogan has a responsibility to not just allow stream of consciousness or you know anything to be said unchecked, to caveat it and say, hey, this is you know a controversial view, this is outside of scientific consensus, this has been proven to be false. If it is false, to not do that, I believe, is irresponsible. This really comes down to a question of what is a podcast? Uh, is a podcast the news or is a podcast a conversation? If it's the news, then you have arguably restrictions on what can be said. If this is just a conversation, then we really have to consider the implications of saying two adults can't release that conversation to a wider audience without some babysitter entity stepping in to make sure that they don't say the wrong things. Rogan made his name on television in the 1990s. A comedian turned actor turned commentator for mixed martial arts fighting. He launched the Joe Rogan Experience in 2009. The Joe Rogan Experience. It is among the most popular podcasts in the world, around 11 million listeners per episode. In 2020, the music streaming platform Spotify looking to diversify its content, made a $100 million deal with Rogan for exclusive rights. An actual expert. The podcast's range of guests is one of its strengths. It also exposes Rogan's weaknesses as a host. He lacks expertise. So when a couple of doctors come on, 
and promote conspiracy theories about COVID-19 and vaccines that have long been disproven. Do you think there's any reason for someone who's already had COVID to get vaccinated? No, there's, there's three studies well characterized and three more that have weighed in and preprint showing harm. Or when Jordan Peterson, a psychologist, spouts something nonsensical on climate change. Now, the climate change one is a weird one, so that well, one... that's because there's no such thing as climate, right? Climate and everything are the same word. Rogan, a graduate of the tough guy world of mixed martial arts, just rolls over. He's not an expert on what the guests are talking about. In this case, Jordan Peterson uh, came on and said that climate change isn't real because it's everything. It means so much that it actually doesn't mean anything. And to Joe Rogan, I mean, he's a UFC guy. He's like, wow, that sounds good. And then they just sort of move on. But uh, yeah, Jordan Peterson, it seems like a, uh, a stoned college student up one night studying for his midterms. That's what it sounds like. Think twice about giving these jabs to your kids. Dr. Peter McCullough and Dr. Robert Malone were problematic for a variety of reasons. They repeated uh, lots of claims about the COVID-19 vaccine in particular, claims that have been widely refuted. A lot of people who are vaccinated were feeling kind of disoriented and confused by these podcasts. I have spent a large part of my time during the pandemic explaining the science and explaining the data. And I found that this was essentially doing uh, the opposite of that. It was breaking trust and causing confusion. Jessica Malati Rivera is one of 270 scientists and healthcare specialists who signed a letter calling out Rogan, demanding Spotify take steps to stop the spread of COVID-19 misinformation. Musicians Neil Young and Joni Mitchell, among others, ordered Spotify to remove their music, saying they did not want to share a platform with Rogan. Spotify countered by saying it will add a content advisory label to any podcast related to COVID-19. The White House waited in, welcoming the advisories, urging Spotify to not just limit misinformation, but to fight it. Um, Rogan appeared to take it on the chin, going on Instagram, disputing some of the criticism, but acknowledging he has to do better. So my pledge to you is that I will do my best to try to balance out these more controversial viewpoints. But that is the same Joe Rogan, who since getting into bed with Spotify, has boasted he can say whatever he wants. I'm gonna get arrested for saying this. Um, you can say whatever you want. Who? Oh, We're thank you. <laughs> like, YouTube's not gonna pull it. Let me tell you something about Spotify. They never with me once. Spotify has never said a goddamn thing to me. They're amazing. Rogan did not want to talk to us, however. Neither he nor Spotify responded to our interview requests. Social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter have been under this kind of scrutiny for years. For Spotify and podcasts in general, it's something new. And part of that is just logistical. Uh, it's very easy to, to uh, crawl through the content of Twitter or Facebook, Instagram, uh, even YouTube because it has captioning and to flag various types of content, whether it be misinformation or seen as offensive. When it comes to podcasts, there are so many of them, and you basically have to go through audio bit by bit uh, to really catch and flag content. It's crazy how we looked at each other when we walked in. As Joe Rogan acknowledged in this video apology, this podcast just started as a way for him to kind of have these freewheeling conversations with people he liked, people he found interesting. And he himself acknowledged that it's basically gotten completely out of control. If he is going to start vetting his guests or start steering the conversations in a less controversial direction, um, that may satisfy some critics, but I think it may also alienate his audience. Spotify released a new platform policy and put a COVID-19 audio warning label on any future episodes uh, that mention COVID-19. As if they're saying uh, your, your content doesn't matter as long as people know that it's objectionable, then we're covered. But uh, it seems extremely unlikely that they'll kill the golden goose of uh, podcasting Joe Rogan for COVID misinformation. As long as the shareholders are happy, uh, the subscribers aren't going anywhere, um, I think nothing's going to happen. Joe Rogan's politics are a mixed bag. He describes himself as a socially liberal libertarian, 
who supports universal health care, along with gun rights. On COVID, though, he has a penchant for the skeptical. Just one day after his Instagrammed promise to do better. And do my best to make sure that I've researched these topics. Rogan tweeted an inaccurate Reuters story on ivermectin, an anti-parasitic drug as a treatment for COVID. Scientists say there is no evidence that it works. Reuters had already corrected that story. Rogan later deleted his tweet without explaining why. As one analyst put it, Joe Rogan is in over his head, and he knows it. But there's more to it than that. We're supposed to be protective of LBGT people. We're Rogan provokes his audiences by hiding his beliefs in curiosity, shrouding them in questions, his choice of some questionable guests. And he keeps going there. I like Joe Rogan's response. I choose to believe him. Uh, I choose to also believe that he doesn't know what he's talking about half the time. The larger issue is that uh, the user is now the media. People aren't relying on television news to get all their news. They get it from a guy like Joe Rogan. And anybody can build a platform and get to where he is. So the genie's out of the bottle. Everybody's the media. It's been a year now since the military took back control of Myanmar. The subsequent unrest has left at least 1,500 people dead and much of the country's media silenced. Johanna Hoos is here with more. Well, Richard, as we reported back then, ever since the junta overthrew Myanmar's fledgling civilian government last February, it has been cracking down on journalism. In the immediate aftermath, five news organizations, including Mazima and Democratic Voice of Burma, were raided and had their licenses revoked. Reporters like Nathan Mung from Kamayut Media and Denny Fenster, an editor at Frontier Myanmar, spent months behind bars on various trumped-up charges. 57 others that we know of remain in prison, making Myanmar the world's second worst jailer of journalists. Others have paid for their work with their lives. Su Nai, a freelance photojournalist, is believed to have been beaten to death in military detention after covering a silent strike against the regime. Pui Ti Dim of Burma News International, who had published allegations of abuses carried out by the security forces, was reportedly abducted by the authorities and executed. Reporting is especially challenging in Myanmar's more remote regions, where the military often acts with impunity. Many news outlets have gone into exile or now do their work underground, increasingly reliant on citizen journalists to gather information. Then there are the internet blackouts and bans on social media. The military has blocked Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, all primary sources of news in Myanmar, and it reportedly has a new cybersecurity law in the works that would criminalize the use of the VPNs people currently rely on to circumvent such bans. In too many ways, the media environment in Myanmar is back to where it was before it embarked on its rocky road to democracy. Yet many reporters there remain determined to get the story out. Thanks, Joe. Going back to a story now that's proven exceptionally difficult to cover, the conflict in Ethiopia between rebel forces led by the Tigray People's Liberation Front, the TPLF, and federal troops under Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Just over a year ago, when the fighting broke out in Tigray, Abiy's government shut down the internet, cut telecommunications, barred journalists from the conflict zone, a near total blackout that is still mostly in place. News, like nature, abhors a vacuum. And one byproduct of the blackout is that online activists on both sides have been filling the gap, sometimes shaping the news coverage. But activists are not journalists. Many of them have agendas that can sully the information that they provide. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on the conflict in Tigray and the activism that, for better or worse, is driving the coverage of the story and the terminology. It's October 2020, one month before the fighting began in Ethiopia and Facebook is the country's dominant social media platform. Then the TPLF attack the federal forces Northern Command in Tikrai. A media blackout is imposed on the region and something curious happens. Internet usage, patterns of online behavior in the rest of the country begin to change. Facebook's share of internet traffic drops from 66% to 40%. 
Twitter climbs from less than 6% to 44%. It was no accident, no mere market-driven shift. It was activism. Almost immediately, within a week, we saw a massive uptick in uh, the number of new Twitter accounts that were registered and that were tweeting almost exclusively about the conflict in Tigray. A lot of these were sort of coalescing around different hashtag campaigns that were established by very young Tigrayan activists in the diaspora. When you look back at uh, the hashtags and all the mobilizations on a global scale, uh, one can certainly deduce that there was pre-planning in starting a global campaign against the federal government and an effort to control the narrative. We knew war was looming uh, because we have seen and heard the rhetoric that was being pushed by the Ethiopian government, but we didn't know that it was going to be this brutal. Meza Gide Gibda Madin is a Tigrayan activist living in the diaspora, amplifying hashtags about the conflict, helping those issues make the jump from social media into the mainstream like the government's involvement of Eritrean troops in the conflict. First of all, we would like to see a strict uh, deadline as to when the Eritrean troops and Amhara militias are supposed to withdraw from, e from Tigray. The alleged use of mass rape as a weapon of war. Whereby women are also being gang raped by military men from the Ethiopian National Army as well as the Amhara militia and Eritrea. So and how inflammatory news coverage in the country is fueling ethnic cleansing. So it is this kind of uh, reckless comments and, and rhetoric that are actually resulting in the massacre in the days of our people. So Gebra Medin doesn't work alone. She and fellow activists set up an organization called Omni Tigray, which uses what Gebra Medin calls an educated form of advocacy to get the world to pay attention to what is happening in Tigray. What that means is we prepare pre-made tweets, we prepare panel discussions, we, we write articles and, and monthly or uh, regular reports. That's how we try to push the, the issue of the Tigray genocide to the international community so that they don't continue to be confused by the propaganda that comes from the Ethiopian government and, it, and its allies. That word Gibra Medin used, genocide, it's a loaded term, one that can have implications both politically and militarily. According to the 1948 Genocide Convention, once the UN declares a genocide, then member states are required to intervene, which hasn't happened in this case. The UN has said that the conflict has been marked by extreme brutality on both sides, but it stopped short at declaring a genocide. That hasn't prevented the term from being used on social media. And if you scroll down Gebra Medin's Twitter feed, you'll see the hashtag Tikray Genocide being used repeatedly and all the way back to November 9th, 2020, starting just four days after the TPLF launched its attack. Yes, I am one of the people who used uh, the hashtag Tigray Genocide early on. And that's primarily because genocide is a crime of intent. Before November 4th, we know what kind of rhetoric was being pushed by the Ethiopian government and its affiliated me media outlets. Uh, we know uh, the Ethiopian government was actively working uh, towards dehumanizing the people of Tigray, towards othering them within the Ethiopian community. So the genocidal intent is right there. The Tigray genocide hashtag was used by many campaigns to raise awareness about their interpretation of events. And that hashtag has been really controversial because the government says that the existence of this hashtag is evidence of a disinformation campaign because they don't agree that there's a genocide going on. The attention on a global scale that uh, the TPLF activities were able to, to, to get at the time have helped them control the narrative on Western media. US Congressman Brad Sherman recently tweeted, what's unfolding in Ethiopia has all the makings of a genocide. Because you, you, you can see that, especially the Tigran genocide and hashtags like that, have attracted wider Western media attention than anything. But a counter campaign was on the way. In November 2021, a new hashtag called No More started trending. The organizers of this campaign say that they are out to set the record straight. In November, we say hashtag no more. The no more false narratives that support killers versus victims. No more media lies. Claire Wilmot is a researcher with the London School of Economics and has been tracking the various hashtags associated with this conflict. Wilmot says that the data pattern of the no more campaign represents a significant departure from what we've seen before. 
What we see now is a much more professional and much more centralized effort to promote this hashtag. I think it was in early November. The highest number of tweets that the No More campaign produced on a single day surpassed 500,000. The highest number that we've tracked from the Tigrayan campaigns has been about 200,000. So it's a significant change in terms of this kind of campaign. These are paid activists, these paid professionals. Some of them are self-proclaimed journalists. They're trying to create false equivalence between those at the receiving of the genocide and those who are perpetuating the genocide. The No More campaign was launched by Hamela Aragawi, an Ethiopian, and Simon Tesfamariam, an Eritrean, both of whom are based in the US. We gave them the opportunity to respond to the allegation that they are backed by the Ethiopian government. We even booked an interview with Aragawi, but on the day of filming, she cancelled. We then made several attempts to reschedule that interview, but Aragawi stopped replying to our messages. We did, however, speak with Abebe Jalor, an Ethiopian journalist who went into exile in the US when the TPLF led the national government in Addis Ababa a reign lasting nearly three decades that was marred with oppression, mass incarceration and censorship. While Jalor says that he is not affiliated with the No More campaign, he does use the hashtag and puts its popularity down to genuine support among Ethiopians at home and in the diaspora who have grown tired of what they call the misreporting of this story. We need to see a more truthful approach, a more balanced approach rather than echoing the propaganda by one side, especially the TPLF, like genocide and the other key terms that uh, they have been pushing out with a massive uh, Twitter campaign. Where does the information come about genocide and things like that? Highly biased, anonymous sources. You cannot report a story, a highly sensitive story like genocide, based on bias. So that's why I also support uh, a movement we, which says no more propaganda, no more lies. Or how about no more media blackout? In the 15 months since the fighting began, the government has only granted the international media one three-month-long window of access to Tigray, when federal forces were in control of the region's capital, Mekelle. That ended eight months ago. Removing mainstream news sources from the conflict has left the information space up for grabs, resulting in a social media war of words and terminology. It's crucial that the government allows for more voices to be weighing in. They've tried so hard to constrain access and it's, it's not worked in anyone's favor, including their own, because they're basically asking people to just accept them at their word. Ordinary global citizens do not really know who to believe and who to trust, so it's very critical that journalists are allowed to access uh, Tigray. One, in order uh, to, to make sure that this genocidal uh, war is documented properly, two, to make sure that perpetrators of the crime are, are held accountable. To this day, no one can say for certain if what is taking place in the region of Tikrai amounts to a genocide, but the red flags are there. The growing evidence that shows that the real victims of this war are the innocent civilians caught in the middle. And journalists must find a way to tell their stories, whether the authorities let them in or not. And finally, back to Myanmar. The first anniversary of the military coup has put the country back on the news agenda. But over these past 12 months, for reasons ranging from the political to the geographical, Myanmar's power struggle has gone underreported. So we're leaving you this week with a list of recommendations where to go online if you want to stay on the story. For English readers, Myanmar Now and Democratic Voice of Burma are good places to start. Then there is Myanmar Witness, a non-profit organization that documents state violence by getting the public to upload the evidence, videos and photos of human rights abuses. Outlets like Kitit Media, The Chindwin and Development Media Group all stay mostly local and focus on coverage of Myanmar's ethnic minority states which are underreported. Outside Myanmar, there is Burma Campaign UK. It relies on funding from the general public to push for the release of political prisoners and keep Myanmar in the news. Finally, some of the people we follow on Twitter. Weiwei Nu, the founder of the Women's Peace Network, activist Itinzar Mong, and Manimong, 
of Human Rights Watch. They're all sticking with this story, even at times when the international media are looking away. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.